Hey everyone, it's Gary. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, welcome to this week's live Path to Prosperity webinar. Um, tonight we're going to wrap up the this whole series on property management, which is kind of ironic <laughs> because tomorrow night the special presentation. It's not the, tomorrow night's not the normal weekly webinar. Um, it's on the training program that it's actually on property management tomorrow night. How about that for for coincident timing? So in any case, uh, welcome aboard to all of you who are, especially all the new folks um, and all the veterans. I see some uh, people from pretty much all over here. That's really good news. Okay. Hope you all are getting ready to have yourself a wonderful Merry Christmas or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah, whichever you you, you practice and um, celebrate. Um, I wish you all the best, obviously, this holiday season. So in any case, let me do this. I'm going to check real quick on everything and make sure everything's okay on the technology side. So hang on one second. Uh, I'm going to type in this in also. Can you see my screen? Whoops. Can you see? There we go. My screen and... Hear my voice. Okay, it took me a while because my typing skills are not all that great. Okay, so that's on the way to you. I'm going to check the attendee panel here first, and then uh, we'll go to the question box. So, okay, attendees. Um, good. Looks like just about everybody's on. So we will go ahead and, and get started. Let me check the questions box, make sure everybody's okay on your end. Um, PF's good. PF, good session last week, man. I appreciate all the input and insights. And you too, Bill and Susan, if you're on. Uh, let's see here. Let me just make sure everybody's okay. All right, Rolando, Beverly, Genevieve, top five. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Genevieve. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to get started here in just a, sec a second. I just want to make sure um, we're all good. We are all good. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the admin stuff first. Um, for those of you who are relatively new, always please remember to check your emails the next day after a webinar because Beverly's going to send you the recording and also some updates if there are any updates to the systems, the different platforms, the learning material, um, and even, even scheduling changes or scheduling additions, for example. So I'll be, uh, by next week, I'll be picking all the webinars for January. So we'll get that out to you. Um, also, I'll be able to add all the January uh, time tree time slots out there for you to choose those time slots when you should you, whenever you feel ready for them. Um, also, uh, if you could, you know, just make sure you, you check those on a regular basis. Uh, we did roll out the affiliate program uh, just a few weeks ago. We have a contest starting, I think, right around the holidays. You want to so keep an eye on that. If you haven't set yourself up yet for that, just look for the information and email. Just look for anything from Beverly that says something about affiliate in there, and you'll see uh, how you can just click on the link. It walks you through the, the setup process. It's For you, it's free. It's easy. And uh, also some good material in there you can use in your own marketing. So in any case, um, you know, for those of you who are new again, you'll recognize you're on mute by default. That's because we can't have everybody in here at the same time talking. OK, uh, it'd be hard for 100 of, us to, 100 of us to be able to do that at the same time. But we can unmute you from time to time. And sometimes we do do that. In the meantime, though, if you could use your question box for questions, that would be awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up now. And we are going to get started. Um, all right, what I did is I'm going to go back a little bit in the material on the property management program. It's actually called Turning Rental Problems into Real Estate Profits, okay? Because um, I realized we actually did not cover this. I, I was wondering last week if we had, and uh, looking back, it didn't look like we had to cover this. So we'll cover this section first. Then we're going to jump to the end and go over evictions. And then we'll even go into some policies and procedures just to round things out. So you should have over the last uh, probably four, I guess this will be the fourth in the this, in this series, a real good idea of what it what it means to or what it takes 
to manage yours or others' properties, right? So in any case, the first thing the Knights is, uh, agenda has to do with um, people who are on a subsidy, subsidy program. We have them in Canada and also in the U.S. In the U.S., they call it Section 8. Okay, Section 8 is part of the HUD or Housing Urban Development Code. Um, it was legislated through Congress years ago. And it's also, also it does not apply to properties. It applies to people, okay? So property is not necessarily Section 8, but people can be Section 8. I know that sounds kind of strange, but... Um, the reality is, is even though there was, there was for a long time uh, a lot of Section 8 housing, government housing, housing was built by government entities, okay? Uh, most of them become, become privatized or even torn down or demolished, okay? There's still a few out there, but for the most part, the government realized it really needs to get people out into the rest of society. And that's why all the people like us were starting to get um, applications going back a generation or two ago from people who are on a Section 8 housing subsidy going to rent one of our units in a duplex, for example, or a single family home, and they weren't all in one particular uh, development, like a housing development like they used to be. Um, in any case, uh, so uh, that's a bit, what that's enough about that. The, the thing is to be on Section 8, a candidate has to meet certain criteria. And I'm not going to get into all that criteria tonight. Um, you can actually find that out by going to your county level uh, HUD department, okay? There's a federal level, state level, level county level, even in, in larger cities and towns, they have a city or town level, okay? So uh, most cases, if you go to the county level, you get everything you need to know, right? Um, if you live in a, a decent metropolitan area, um, decent size, you know, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Buffalo, um, you know, Sacramento, they're all going to have their own individual department within the county. And you can always ask them for all of their rules and regulations. Okay, it's public information because guess what? It's a government agency and our tax dollars all cover all that. Okay, um, you can also look much of this up online. You can even go to the uh, your local Section 8 website and get all kinds of information out there. You can go to HUD, HUD HUD.gov and get all kinds of information out there. Okay, on what it, what are the qualifications? What are the rules and regulations? What are the benefits? What are the features? Or they're all out there. Um, now, having said all that, this is listening. This is not going to be a, a lecture on how someone becomes a Section Eight candidate. Just know that they're typically uh, have lower economic means. They're below a certain level of, of income. Uh, they perhaps have a certain number of dependents that are people who are dependent on them uh, to care for them. Okay. Um, so there's usually situations like that. But what I would tell you is this. I'm just going to go over what my experience has been with this. And early on, I will tell you uh, it was pretty good. My experience was pretty good with Section 8. I didn't do it right away. Um, in fact, I didn't. Uh, and it was probably five years or so before I ever really got into Section 8 because the, the properties I were purchasing, um, I was purchasing, I had no problem getting tenants. And then what happened is, and some of this, you, you'll remember this, guys, is back in the 90s, it actually all started back in the 70s. Lots of things started in the 70s. Um, there was a real move to have, um, decent housing for everybody, which is absolutely a necessity. There was also a push to have more homeowners, okay, um, and things like that. And then what happened in the 90s is uh, there was another big push for home ownership, and so the federal government lowered the the uh, lending standards, the lending requirements, to be able to get a, a mortgage on a property. So more people became uh, homeowners as a result. Now back to the 70s. There was another uh, um, whiz -bang idea, which was, why don't we package up all these mortgages and sell them on the open market as investments that you and I can invest in, which we still do today. That's what they did back in the 70s. So you take that, coupled with the fact that more people were able to now become homeowners in the 90s, that, and that created a real demand for additional loan processors. So this whole new wave of business came into play within that whole framework 
uh, there was you had mortgage bankers, mortgage brokers, um, you know, and the mortgage brokers were people like um, they have a third party company and you go to them, apply and they take your all your information, have you do an application. They will submit your application to multiple banks. They basically are doing all that work, nearly not necessarily for you, but for the banks. OK, you can go directly to a bank, but you can also go to a mortgage broker. Well, what happened is the mortgage brokers, as you might imagine, were um, wherever you involve lots of money and power, greed kicks in and fraud kicks in. And that's exactly what happened. So throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, um, you remember that the tenant base was really dwindling. So as a result, I started entertaining. This is what I'm getting to. This is when I started entertaining taking on Section 8 tenants. Had no intention to. It was purely accidental. I had a young couple respond to one of my ads for one of my big three-bedroom units. And I said, sure, come on by. Come take a look. And at that point, things were changing. And I figured, well, what the, what have I got to lose? Uh, so they came in, showed me their credentials. They were very well prepared. Um, I think they had something like three or four children um, trying to make ends meet. The, the dad was working. The mom was working part time. And I saw a lot of potential of them. Turns out they were some of my best tenants ever. OK, they stay with me for years. I'm talking like eight, eight something years. Um, but in any case, what I'm getting at is they were Section 8. They were on a Section 8 subsidy from the federal government. And Section 8 had paid the majority of the rent. And at the time, uh, what Section 8 would do for some families is they would say they would pay for some of the rent. And then the family had to make up the, the difference of whatever the Section 8 approved rent was. OK, in other words, the rent had to be approved by Section 8 and they were cover and they would cover some or, or all of it. And if they only covered some, the Section 8 tenant had to make up the difference. Years later, they started doing away with that. And whatever the approved rent was, Section 8 paid it. And the reason is, is um, turns out some landlords were being unscrupulous. And they uh, even though they didn't necessarily go through Section 8 to raise the rents, they would raise the rent on a tenant. And a tenant was making up more of a difference than their Section 8 contract required them to. So Section 8 decided to clamp down on the whole thing and change everything. And they did. But for a couple of years, guys, it was actually really good. I took on some more. Um, I will tell you that they also had, at the time, some of you may remember this, a Section 8 homeowners program that uh, was in place to encourage, enable, uh, Section 8 renters to become Section 8 owners, owners of their own homes and paying their own mortgage payment, no longer paying rent. And I participated in that. I turned over several of my properties to some of my Section 8 tenants who then became owners. They actually bought the properties. Uh, so just briefly, uh, what, what happened is usually the state, some state agency would provide a grant for the deposit and uh, Banks would get would supply loans, um, provide loans for the Section 8 people that were backed up by HUD, Housing or Development. They were insured by HUD, so they really had nothing to lose. And lo and behold, this person who was once a tenant could become a proud homeowner and live part of the American dream. Um, quite a challenge. You guys might imagine a little bit of a process to go through all the inspections. And I, what I did is, here's what I did that was unique. Obviously, I was investing, buying rentals, flipping homes, so forth and so on. So what I decided to do was when I came across a really sweet deal on a flip, I would purchase it. Basically, put I would be the, the front person, put them, you know, purchase the property, remodel it, all the while having it under contract to, to be purchased from one of my Section 8 tenants. The difference is, is I didn't charge them full retail price. I didn't charge them full ARV. I, I let them go through the Section 8 process and they would send an appraiser out and they would give me an as is an appraisal and a as completed or after repair value appraisal. And they were often, you know, sometimes lower than what I wanted. But the thing is, I wanted to have my tenants enjoy the benefits of owning their own home. So that was to me a uh, win win. I you know, paid myself a commission, paid myself a management fee, as well as got some some capital gains out of it. So at the end, every, everybody won. This person got a brand spanking new home with a yard, you know, I, it, with a mortgage payment lower than rent, by the way. And I got a sale of a property 
and got to make somebody happy family. So in any case, long story short is this. It was after that, about that time, that Section 8 uh, management changed. And what they started doing in the government, government's infinite wisdom, if you're, not, if you're a government employee here, please forgive me. Uh, I come from a family of government employees, basically military. And what they did was this. They decided at a certain point that they were going to lower the approved rental rates on single family homes because in their mind, the tenants were having to pay not just gas and electric, but water and sewage because it was a single family home. More, more than that, the gas and electric are often more expensive than what they would have paid in, in, a, in an apartment, which is true. But in the government's logic, they thought, well, then therefore, they shouldn't have to pay as much rent. So they lower the approved rental rates on single family homes. Their logic was because the tenant had to pay more in gas and electric, the house is worth less. Well, you and I all know that is not true. However, you can't just go try to fight Uncle Sam or City Hall and see what happens, okay? So what happened is over time, oh, and by the way, at the same time they did, they were increasing rates on the apartments, okay? Could be three bedroom apartment, three bedroom single family home, Lo and behold, the apartment was getting more money and income than the single family home was. <laughs> Go figure. So what I did was I stopped uh, taking on new Section 8 tenants for single family homes. I didn't have a lot of them, but I stopped doing that because um, I was not making as much money, obviously, and this was a business for me. And I started taking on more people in the apartments because I was making more money. Um, it was a shame that they did that because they caused a lot of uh, – angst in the areas that where they were doing this and it was usually the um the northern states you know um any case uh, fast forward as time went on i noticed and i would go to the annual meetings by the way and here's what i noticed they started the rules started to become more tenant friendly and less owner friendly for example in the old days if you had a section 8 tenant who let's say was paying a portion of the rent and they weren't keeping up with their portion, you could notify Section 8, and Section 8 would would give them a chance to make good on their debt. And if they didn't, they would take them out of the Section 8 program. Pretty severe. But it, believe it or not, it worked. Pe more people were paying the rent on time. There were fewer headaches. Well, they did away with that. Okay? What they were saying was, um, if you had a beef with a tenant, and you had an eviction process, it was like Section 8 didn't care. They were not going to boot them off the program anymore. So all of, the, all of a sudden, these folks now were not paying any portion of the rent. They, all the rent was being paid for them by Section 8. They absolutely had no skin in the game. And even when they had damaged the apartment, this is true when it came to damage issues. Let's say they had rented an apartment to a Section 8 tenant, and they had caused damage, the doorways, windows, hallways, whatever. And if you filed a complaint with Section 8, they would say, well, you can go evict them if you want to. Good luck. And they would just wash their hands of it. They would not lean or put any pressure on the tenant. So we lost a lot of leverage on the ownership side. And eventually, I, I through attrition, um, ended up getting rid of all of my Section 8 tenants. I, I, I kept some of them, um, but they eventually left through attrition. But for the most part, I did not take on any new Section 8 tenants. That was around the mid to late 2000s. Um, there are some parts of the country that are better than others as far as how Section 8 is administered and, and managed. Um, but I just want to give you some in-the-field experience so that you can make your own determination if you if you have your own units to rent or if you have owners looking to buy, get clients, investors looking to buy and sell, buy and or sell their properties. And when Section 8 comes up as a subject, you can speak intelligently about it, okay? So in any case, let me do this. Let me take a quick pause here and check for questions. If you got questions so far, type in. We're going to next talk about charitable organizations, okay? Okay, let's see here real quick. I'm almost done <clears throat> scanning here. Let's see. Hello. Going through all the hellos and yeses. Okay, so this is PF. PF says, if you wanted to increase the rent, was Section 8 different or more difficult than regular tenancy? Good question, PF. 
more difficult, okay? Um, as you might imagine, I learned a lot about Section 8 over the years. I'd go to the annual meetings, I'd sit on the panels, voice my opinion, and here's what they would say. If you read the contracts, the fine print, it says, you don't just have to notify the tenant you're going to increase the rent 60 days in advance. You have to notify Section 8 60 days in advance. Well, guess what? As you might imagine, they're about 60 days behind schedule on almost everything. It would take sometimes a month to get an inspector out there to approve to get a tenant approved for a certain unit. But in any case, um, I would submit rent increases only to the not that just basically had them ignored. I would call up and I'd say, what's going on? I submitted my request on time, you know, two months in advance. And they'd say, well, that's not early enough. And I said, well, that's what your contract says. They said, we are so far behind. We're working on the ones from six months ago. In other words, translation was PF. I should have submitted my request six months in advance. <laughs> so I guess what I started doing at that point, I started submitting my request. I did this every year, it's six months in advance. I would go down there and knock on the door and visit in person, the, the, the office, by the way. I would submit it a five months in advance, four months in advance, three months in advance, just continually submit my request. And I literally one time had to go sit in the manager's office until they pulled my file and got my rent increase. And that, it got to be such a headache. That's one of the reasons why I essentially um, left the program here, because, because of that. It just, I'm not knocking them. They're just so overworked and so understaffed. There's no way they, they got bigger problems than you and I dealing dealing with you and I, you know. Um, okay, the other question. Uh, this is from Jeanette. Hi, Jeanette. Let's see. Uh, hi, hello, Gary. It's Jeanette. A Section 8 has still has a program to assist tenants who want to purchase a home. I believe they pay the mortgage for X number of years. If disabled, they pay it indefinitely. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Jeanette, I was um, a huge proponent of that because when I was a kid, we lived in a in a project uh, for a couple of years, and you know a lot of my friends lived in homes and neighborhoods. And I thought, well, my dream when I grew up was I'm gonna, my mom's gonna have a house, <laughs> okay. And boy, does she have a house now. But back then, um, I didn't know what it was. We just tossed that's just what was normal. Um, but I remember my mom saying things like she'll she can never own a home. It's for rich people. Blah 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 blah. All this negative programming. So I'm I'm glad that the program is there. Um, I wish more people would take advantage of it. Sadly, the stats on it, Jeanette, are not that great as far as people participating in it. Um, I have no idea why. I mean, you've got this opportunity to own a piece of the American dream, and so many people don't take advantage of it, you know? Um, but thank you for sharing that. I, I'm glad to know that it's still around. Um, in any case, let's do this, guys. I want to move on and talk about uh, charitable organizations. And you guys can read all about this anyways. You can, you know, Get the book, get the training program. Um, everything is in there. You know, all the links, um, all the rules, regulations, all that stuff is in there. Even all the forms, all the policies, procedures, it's all in there. But what I want to do right now is go into charitable organizations. So generally speaking, um, you're familiar with some of them. You know, you're like... Jewish Community Center, Catholic Charities, which St. Vincent of Paul is part of. Um, let's see, uh, what's another one I worked with in the past? It was, uh, um, in any case, uh, every city has them, every county has them. Local churches often can help out in certain situations. Um, in the beginning, I didn't know that this that they did this stuff, right? What, what, what happened with me is I had a tenant one time call up. And she said, Mr. Wilson, I just want to inform you um, whatever the situation was. She had lost her job or something like that. And she was distraught and she went to seek help from a local charity that were going to call me up to go over things and they were willing to help out pay one month's rent. And I thought, well, boy, how, how wonderful is that? You know, I get to get my rent paid. I don't have to, to, to chase somebody down, go file for eviction, all of that. And this person gets a, gets a hand up. Uh, in the situation okay so a couple things here and i'll go over these lessons here in a bit but i did learn one big one which is this you know my philosophy was always uh you know right out of the scriptures you know you, you give a man a fish he eats for a day you teach a man a fish and he fishes for a lifetime well i'm here to tell you i'm all about teaching people how to fish where they can do for themselves 
but sometimes people just need a fish. <laughs> okay. You know, at that moment in time, they need it. They need help right then, right there. And you've got to make a judgment call on that. And I can tell you, you can be a good business owner. You can be a good landlord and you can also be a compassionate person. There is a way to do it. It's case by case. I can't tell you there's a, a script to follow. Um, it's literally case by case, but you really learn to you learn a lot about human nature. Okay. One of the things I learned is this is like this young lady who called up, she had, she didn't wait around. She didn't not call me. She didn't let me discover by the fifth of the month her rent wasn't in and then me chase her down. She was proactive. So guess what? In the future, people who are proactive, I thought, have their act together, they're action takers, they're going to work it out, and I'll work with them. The people that were not calling you and ignoring you, not returning your calls and not communicating, chances are that one's going going uh, south real quick. I would also listen to the words they say. Look for certain language patterns. In other words, people who would say, hey, you know, yep, I lost my job, but you know what? I just got my resume updated. I sent it in the mail today to 12 different employers, and I'm going to go visit them tomorrow and make, you know, that person's going to make it, right? On the other hand, if you come across a person that says, well, boy, boy, times sure are tough. I'm hoping my old rich Uncle Bob will help me out. I'm going to be giving him a call. Or, I, you know, I'm going to play the lottery. I hope I win the lottery. All this, you know, hoping and wishing stuff was not working out ever. People that were hoping and wishing almost never worked it out. People that were taking action and had plans and specific things they could tell me and dates and times and names, I worked with them, okay? So in any case, um, back to the charitable organizations. Um, it turns out that when you're a good landlord and you, you're able to help a tenant out or allow one of these organizations to help a tenant out so you get paid from the organization on behalf of the tenant um, and you're okay with it, they'll keep your name because sometimes they have people come in there distraught because they need a place to live or, you know, a couple breaking up at just all kinds of situations and they'll call up and they'll say, you know, we, we have a particular client from our church, you know, we can vouch for the character. We know they're good people. A uh, couple split up. The mom needs a home quickly for she and her two children. Okay. Um, we'd be willing to pay their rent and deposit. Are you, would you be willing to do this? And I would often say yes. I would always scream and inter interview and scream, just like any tenant. Same thing with Section 8 guys. Um, you don't change your policies and procedures when it comes to screening. Always, always screen, always interview, always screen, just like we talked about it several weeks ago. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, so that, that went on for a long, long time. And there was a lot of organizations. It was amazing how um, your your name, your reputation can spread. Uh, but here's here's what I'm getting to. The big thing was this. Uh, some of you may remember back in the late 90s, uh, Bosnia was really a war-torn country. It was just a sad state of affairs, what was happening there. Um, essentially genocide, if you remember. Well, people were escaping there. Um, you know, they were, they were, there were refugees going all over the place. Well, we were getting them here in Canada and the U.S. too. And I was approached by, um, here, here's what happened. I bought a property, a duplex from a local church. The church um, didn't, it, one of their parishioners had passed away and they bequeathed it to the church. Well, the, the realtor who had the listing was in St. Vincent of Paul Society. He was a call war banker. Austin DeSimone was his name. He's since passed away. Awesome, awesome gentleman. He, at the closing table, he never mentioned this the whole time. During the viewing, any kind of stuff, nothing. Contract negotiations. The closing, it says, I just want to tell you, young man, we've been using this property as a home for refugees from Bosnia through the church. We would love to, to keep doing that. If you're agreeable to it, I can, I can tell you more about the project and how it works and how you can benefit yourself and help out a good cause. And I said, absolutely. Well, a week later, Austin was in my kitchen with a Bosnian family and a translator with multiple different dialect translation books um, going over a lease for this, this couple with two children to rent one of my um, townhomes. And I thought, how cool is this? They didn't speak a lick of English. 
And uh, and what's interesting is that your their young children were the same age as mine, guys. So I was trying to help them kind of connect my children and their children. So my kids, I went and said, go in there and turn on, you know, whatever you want to turn on, cartoons, what have you. Um, uh, actually, I think it was this time of year and there were some Christmas shows on. In any case, I was asking them, hey, do you want, you know, do you want whatever candy? You want chips? You want? They were like looking at me and kind of nodding and shaking their heads. They didn't understand. And then I said, would you like a Coke? And all of a sudden their eyes popped up. And they, right, they knew what Coca-Cola was. So in any case, um, within minutes, the kids are in there communicating, um, watching TV, laughing, having a good old time. And we had signed a lease for this family. Um, I got the deposit paid, first month's rent, and I gave them a $25 discount on every rent going forward. And they ended up being some of my best tenants. So in any case, fast forward to the current day, starting back about 10 years ago, um, we started getting a lot of families from Burma and Nepal, um, lots of them. Those are sort of border provinces between India and China. And a lot of people, Christianity, we, Christianity was spreading really rapidly out there. And some of the people felt um, uh, unsafe or persecuted. So they came to the States, you know, all, all through proper channels. Um, and they came through a combined effort of Catholic Charities and Jewish Community Center. And they approached me and one of my partner, my partner on one of the big part, car, apartment complexes. By the way, it was the, the one Bevan I like to use it as example a lot because it, I did so many things with it. It was so easy to use it as a model of success for in a number of ways. But we said, yes, we will take on uh, refugee families from Jewish Community Center and Catholic Charities. And uh, we, we said we would take on, you know, just one, one at a time, one this month, one next month. Well, it turns out they are some of the best tenants we've ever had. Apparently in Burma and Nepal, it would be an absolute dishonor to the family to not meet an obligation, contractual obligation. They would pay their rent on time no matter what. So we upped the ante. We said, hey, we'll take more of those guys. And um, boy, we did me that building within a couple of years, probably about five years had gone to about 75% um, refugee be occupied. And once we had, to, we had some learning to go through. I mean, they wanted to keep all their shoes outside in the hallways. We didn't think anything of that initially. We figured that out pretty quickly. What we couldn't figure out is they were also leaving big 50 pound bags of rice out in the hallway for storage because <laughs> it was cooler. And, um, and, and sometimes their garbage, they, they thought that was we had to do that. And then they would take it out to the street once a week. So we had to correct all that. But what was interesting, guys, is I learned a lot about the cultures. I also learned a little bit about the language, like the name for mother and grandmother and grandfather. Grandmothers are revered in their cultures. I also learned the greeting, namaste. And if and I used to take my shoes off before I'd go into a unit, step in, um, put my, my hands together, and balance and namaste and the kids thought that was the coolest thing in the world and just start laughing and giggling and i I'd always ask where's the grandmother i can't remember the name for grandmother but I'd always ask because i knew she was around somewhere and she'd get the big smile on her face that i knew what the name for grandmother was and in any case turned out guys one of the best experiences i've ever had unbelievable and here's the kicker don't ever turn down an opportunity to serve um that building turned out to be 95% uh, paid up by the fifth of the month. That is one tremendous collection rate on any apartment building and anywhere that I've ever heard of. Um, just an amazing thing. They did a great job keeping up outdoors. Um, you know, there were language barrier problems and things like that. They wanted to do laundry in their own wash tub and their own bathtub, excuse me, they didn't want to use the laundry facilities. Um, you know, things would happen from time to time. But for the most part, probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. Did it just purely from service. And lo and behold, ended up being a real moneymaker, you know. So how's that for uh, for irony? Um, okay, share organizations. You can definitely, definitely make them one of your partners in your business, guys, okay? Um, so what I want to do right now is I want to go into um, – I want to talk about evictions. Let me just check for questions here real quick. Hang on one second. Um We've got some questions. So hang on. Let's see. That was PS question. Jeanette. Um, okay, we're good on questions. So let me do the search for eviction. Okay. 
Eviction. Eviction. Here we go. Um, oops, should, here we go, way down here, I'm sorry. Wrong, wrong place, right subject, wrong page. Okay, here we go. Um, first, I'm going to give you some basic rules of the game, guys. This is, boy, I, I um, you know, my hope and wish and dream is that you don't have to go through a lot of these, but chances are you will. If you build up your your client base enough, you get enough units, your portfolio, it, it's, it's not a matter of this, it's just a matter of when. It is going to happen, okay? So I want to give you some basics first. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of um, how you apply the rules, okay? Um, which is according to the law, by the way. All right, so first things first. In most states and provinces, um, you have to have a certain grace period on the payment of rent, which means um, if somebody doesn't pay rent to you on the first of the month, that doesn't mean on the second you can go right to court. There's generally a grace period. And it's usually, on average, I've seen it five days. So it's almost five days wherever I've been. Then on the sixth day, you can file for eviction. However, many states and provinces now, well, they have for a long, long time, have what's called a, um, a notice period, okay? Um, what that means is um, you, even though somebody is five days late, you can't just take them to court. You have to give them notice that you're going to take them to court, okay? And that could be 10 days. On average, just to say it's 10 days. That means you can't do anything to the 15th of the month. Well, guess what? Now the month's half over, and another half a month, you got another rent to hopefully be coming in the door. So what the uh, successful people have done is this. In the lease, and this is legal, at least wherever I've seen it, and uh, you put it in the lease, uh, what's called a waiver of right to notice, okay? And the prospective tenant signs that along with everything else in the lease. What that means is, is they waive their right to be given a notice that you're taking in the court. In other words, it's a foregone conclusion. It's implied that if they're behind on their rent by five days, you're going to take them to court. And by the way, guys, I know this sounds tough, but yes, you should. You should take them to court, Okay. Um, so in any case, a waiver of right to notice. Now, uh, a couple of other things here. We'll, 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 we've got more to go over. Um, when you file for the eviction, you're going to get a date, a court date set. This is typically at the magistrate's level. In most places, it has to be no less than seven days out and no longer than 14 days out. So somewhere between seven and 14 days you'll get a date set for you and the tenant to meet in front of the judge. I mean, let's just assume this is for non-payment of rent, okay? There's other reasons to evict it. Let's just take this one first. Um, so you have your court date. You go in there. Now you're going to be prepared. And you, I want you to write this down, by the way. You should definitely have a, uh, the original of the lease that everybody signed and a copy of it to leave with the court. You should also have bring with you the originals of your telephone questionnaire that you first did when you screened them over the phone and the application they filled out when you saw them, met them in person, and also any any paid invoices, any receipts, like for security deposits that they paid, okay? And also bring in your policies and procedures, all right? So in any case, bring all that in, bring an extra set, a copy for the, for the, for the court. If you're really good, you'll bring in even another copy for the tenant. In case the judge asked, did you bring a copy for the tenant? Now, if a judge ever asked me that, I'd say, well, judge, they've already got their copy. All this, all the te tenant's going to say, oh, no, I don't, and it's your word against theirs. So I always come prepared showing that they, they signed the thing that says they've received everything, too. <laughs> so guess who's prepared and guess who's not? That's right. You're prepared, and the tenant is not prepared. Um, now, let's say you – when you get your judgment, which is going to be what's called now a judgment uh, for possession, um, or sorry, judgment for um, uh, arrears and rent, okay? And you can now collect from the person. You could always collect from the person. But let's say another 10 days goes by. Let's just say the rule is 10 days in your state or province. In another 10 days, if the tenant still hasn't paid up, you can then go take the judgment you've already received, go back to court, 
and, and file for what's called possession. Okay. In other words, you got the judgment for the deficiency amount and they still haven't paid. Now you're going to go for possession because they didn't pay yet. 10 and 10 more days is going by where now the judge is going to set another date. Okay. And what that date is the date for the magistrate to go poach the property, literally post a notice on the door that, Hey, you're going to, you're going to get evicted if you don't pay up in such and such a day. So, so in other words, the, the time period between when you got your judgment and you go back with your judgment for non-payment is 10 days. The judge is going to take that order. It is going to assign it to a constable typically. And that'll do that'll happen within seven to 14 days. And then that constable has say seven to 10 days to actually post it. So you might imagine if you had all these time frames up, you could be looking at easily over a month. That's just an average. There are some states like Florida, in Texas, you could have somebody out fairly quickly. Other states, you know, New Jersey, New York, California, some of the provinces, Ontario, Quebec, it could take a while. Okay. Um, so let's just take the example we gave. So, first off, you got to wait a minimum to the fifth. Let's say you did the waiver of right to notice. Your attendant signed that. So, on, on the sixth, you file for eviction. You get your court date 10 days later. Okay. Somewhere between seven and 14 days. Let's say it's 10 days. So then on the 16th, you have your first court date. Let's say you win you win the, the case. The judge says, yep, you, the guy owes you money. He's got to pay you, blah, blah, blah. That's the 16th. Well, 10 days goes by. They still haven't paid you. On the 26th, you go back in, tell the judge, show them I've got this order uh, for deficiency, right? And the deficiency judgment is called. Tenant still hasn't paid. I'd like to file for possession. They'll let you file right there. Um, that's on the 26th. They, they have, they have so many days, let's say they take seven days to assign it to the magistrate. Now that takes you to, and it's a, let's say it's a 30 day month. That's on the 26th on the third of the following month, the magistrate gets it. Then he has so many days to go post it. He posted in seven days. That's now the 10th of the following month. And then the person has 10 more days to pay up before he physically evicts them. That's the 20th of the following month. You see why I tell people do not hesitate to file for eviction. Though every day you wait, it's another day of lost income. You file right away, not only because you, you, you give the process the shortest time period possible, but also you let the world know that you mean business. You're serious about your business and you know what you're doing and you're not taking any growth from anybody. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times just by doing that, more people would pay up between the 5th and the 15th or the 6th and the 15th because they did not want to go to court. They would pay up and have to pay the initial filing fee, by the way, too. Um, so that's a general guideline of what happens with evictions. And, and by the way, a couple more things here. Let's say you do have a person physically evicted or for whatever reason they leave and they leave their personal belongings. Okay. There's a, a different body of law when it comes to a person's uh, personal possessions. So let's say they leave and they've left, to you it looks like garbage, bags of crap and old broken down furniture and clothes that are sold and left behind. Well, believe it or not, you can go try to throw all that stuff away, but be, be very, very wary because a tenant could be watching and as soon as they see you throw everything out, they'll go to court and say, hey, I went to go back and get my stuff, and that, that son of a gun threw all my stuff out on the street. You will find yourself in court very quickly. Okay. What there, the, the, unfortunately, the body of law on this particular component here, personal items, personal articles, is not very clear. It's different from state to state, province to province, and different judges will interpret it differently. Usually, what it says is you have to exercise reasonable care for another person's belongings for a reasonable period of time. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, I've had judges tell me, well, that means seven days. I've had other judges tell me, well, that means 30 days. I've had other judges tell me, well, that means if you want to get your apartment back, you got to take that stuff, put it in storage, which means you got to pay for storage, keep it for 30 days. And, and if they still don't come and get it, then you can do whatever you want with it. Okay. Um, that's a lot of baloney if you ask me, but that's what I'm just telling you. You've got to find out 
how your, your particular judge in your area, your magistrate, views this matter. As I know a lot of owners who didn't know this, and they would go throw stuff out, only to call me up later and say, hey, Gary, I followed the eviction process, and that son of a gun took me to court because I threw his crap out on the street. <laughs> well, consider this your, your warning, but uh, the bottom line is, here's what I would do. I would take all their stuff, take it to a part of the house that isn't really necessary. Maybe there's a garage, maybe there's a basement, uh, whatever. You know, at a minimum, I would take it on the back deck in boxes and make sure the whole thing is covered out, covered under a tarp. I, that would be only the last resort. Generally speaking, I keep it in the basement. Um, and I would tell them they got, you know, 10 days to come get it, whatever. If they don't, I'm going to take it out. And I would make a copy of it and, and uh, keep that with my records. Um, any case, uh, let me bring your panel back over, guys, so I can see if you got any questions on eviction so far. Um, remember, you can remember you can find all these guidelines um, on that website I showed you guys. I think the week before last. So, okay, we got a question from Genevieve. Hi, Genevieve. Great call earlier, by the way. Uh, all right, for three personal items, you can put an amendment in the lease and advise them. Okay, well, that's good news for, for Quebec. I um, appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. All right, what I want to do now, guys, is give you an example of one um, that I went through years ago. And uh, the reason this is a good example because it actually involves a police officer, okay? So I get a, uh, a response to one of my ads for one of my, one of my best units. Awesome, awesome two-story unit it was actually an apartment second floor apartment with a third floor had like uh four bedrooms i think awesome huge living room front porch back porch kitchen dining room hardwood floors the whole nine yards just an amazing place and this lady came by with a little baby she said we'd like to rent your apartment she said my husband can't be here he, he's a police officer um, i can't tell you the borough because if i mention it uh, this was actually written up. It was a news story about it, and I don't. I got to be careful. Um, I don't want to. And it's public information, but you know, it's in the past. Let uh, let bygones be bygones. In any case, she said my husband's a police officer in the, the next borough over. He couldn't be there, and I'm here on my mind. All I'm here is police officer, guaranteed rent, guaranteed work. You know, probably good good father, good husband, good family, the whole nine yards. Okay. And so when I went through the screening and interview process, I did it in a cursory fashion. I didn't follow my own rules, okay? I thought, man, I've got a married couple here. Oh, and she and she did say they had three other children. So a great family for a big unit, um, lots of room, lots of space. And, you know, who could be a bad person with small kids? <laughs> Remember all these things I'm saying, guys. We're going to come back here in a few minutes. So in any case, I went through the process. But I didn't really check things out like I should. I did even check references on um, the current tenancy. I thought, what the heck? The guy's a cop, you know? Um, any case, lo and behold, let him move in. First month, not, no problem. Rent's paid. Everything's okay. Second month, rent's late, you know? So I decided, well, well, okay, I'm trying to find these people. Nobody's responding. Um, I thought, do I call the police department and see if I can find the husband? The wife's not responding. So what I did was I went down to the magistrate in the municipality that was uh, where this house was located. I knew I knew the judge, first name basis. Uh, remember the old joke, you know you're evicting too many people when the judge knows you by your first name. Well, the reality is, is his son was the mayor, and um, I, I, I knew him and his son. Um, a great family, by the way, and I hope they we work together to do some revitalization projects in the area. It's pretty awesome stuff. In any case, um, I said, hey, you know, Judge, I just want to run something by here. I'm not sure what to do. I never come across this. I've got a family I've recently rented to. Husband's a police officer. Um, they haven't paid it, and the well, wife's not responding. Do you think I should try to contact the, the policeman? And he said, what's his name? And I told him, and he shook his head, and he said, Gary. He said, you made a huge mistake. How did, how did you let those guys in? I said, I assumed it was a slam dunk. He said, no, you're going to have to go through the eviction and get ready get ready for a, this is going to be a doozy. Um, and boy, was he right. So in any case, so I filed the paperwork right there on the spot. Um, had my court hearing, you know, two weeks later, they, they never even showed up. 
the husband or wife, nobody showed up. Go by the unit. I can tell they're still there, um, but it was cold. I'm thinking, my gosh, pretty damn cold here. In any case, um, um, so the 10 days goes by. You know, I've got the judgment for for in arrears for the rent being in arrears. Went back, filed for the for the possession. You know, I got to wait 10 days for that. So the magistrate posts the property. Okay, notifies me. So far, so good. Then he calls up and he says, well, we've got to go do the physical eviction. Nobody's responding. Can you meet me there? Bring a locksmith to change the locks. So I said, sure, no problem. I was shocked. I just didn't know. I thought they'd be gone. That's what I thought. I thought they'd be gone. So I had one of the handyman meet me there with a new set of locks and bolts and everything. <clears throat> Get to the back door. The teenage daughter opens up and she's holding the little baby. And they're wrapped up in wearing coats, wrapped up in blankets. And I said, you know, would you mind if we come in? And your parents are, she said, no, we haven't seen them. And I said, excuse me? She said, we haven't seen them for a couple of days. So we go inside, magistrate, me, and the handyman. And I realized at that point, the heat's been turned off, okay? Um, thank goodness the electricity was on, okay? But uh, heat was off. The kids were freezing. And I said, listen, the, the constable, I said, we can't. We can't go forward with this. We're not going to kick out minors. And he said, well, I, he said, I wouldn't do it anyways. And I said, so I said, can you, can you get your cell phone, young lady? We need to start calling. She said, I don't have a phone. I said, you're going to take my phone. And once you start calling, any phone number you can remember. She said, well, who should I call? I said, just call anybody. Uh, aunt, uncle, grandparent, old neighbor, friend, relative, somebody from school, somebody from church, anybody. The only person she could remember was her prior landlord. <laughs> So she called the prior landlord, and the guy pulls up about 20 minutes later with a big giant van. Thank goodness we had a big van. Walks upstairs, looks at the constable, looks at me, and he says, what kind of America is it when we kick out children on the street? And I said, well, what kind of America is it when parents abandon their children in a situation like this? I said, we're not kicking them out. You came here to get them. You know, we didn't know what we are going to do next. We weren't going to leave them, but we figured we'd rather have somebody know them take them, then take them down to the court and have them get processed through um, shortening these services. So in any case, uh, um, he took the kids. Um, we changed the locks. It ended up being a very huge lesson for me, which is always, actually, let me ask you guys what you think the lesson is. What lesson, what's the biggest lesson I learned in that whole experience? And it goes back to the very first class we had on this subject. So I'm going to let you guys take a second to type in your responses and see uh, see what responses I get. And don't worry about being right or wrong. I just want to see your response. What do you think the biggest lesson is I learned here? Or better put, what did I what did I do not do that I should have done? Um let's see they're starting to pour in. And and tell me tell me tell me like you see it guys. Don't be don't be kind because I'm the teacher. Tell me hit me over the head. I mean I've never done this again obviously but this is Jeanette. Yeah Jeanette spot on. I didn't go through the screening and interview process like I should have. I went through it in a cursory fashion, cutting corners, taking shortcuts, thinking I got a slam dunk, right? And boy, was I wrong. If I had simply gone through the process, run the entire report, got the criminal background, which is public records, credit, you know, job history, their living history, their housing history, excuse me. Um, I would have been able to piece it together. All right. Oddly enough, though, guys, the police officer had his job, kept it for a while. What happened is he finally lost his job. Um, I'll just tell you what happened. I didn't mention any names. I was pretty careful of that. He got addicted to crack. If you can imagine a police officer getting addicted to crack. Well, he did. Okay. And eventually lost his job. And um, that was the end of it all. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. He didn't do due diligence. Yeah. Diligent implementation of background check. That was Rolando, you're right, Rolando, yep. Um, verify info, in, info, yep, Helene, you're right. Uh, follow your protocol, Gary, that's right, <laughs> to get the best tenants. Um, uh, Will Moreau, lesson is that every tenant goes through the exact same screening. Boy, Bill, you hit the nail on the head, man. You know, I, I could have been in more trouble, you know, because I didn't treat them the same way I treated everybody else in the in the process. I didn't follow my policies and procedures. Um, you're exactly, exactly right. Um, 
Yeah, Beverly says, trust no tenant, no matter what, without thorough screening. That's right. Doug, Doug Carroll, never assume. Hey, Doug, you're probably getting a good lesson on this one. <laughs> I know that we're looking at some big properties for you, but, um, you know, we're going to do what we're going to do, Doug, is help you actually locate the right kind of property management company. We'll, we'll ask to see their policies and procedures and, and all of that because we want to see data. We want to see data, right? Um, but I got to tell you guys, one of the biggest lessons I ever learned um, is to, if you got policies and procedures, just follow them. You know, never, ever take a shortcut. I uh, learned a valuable lesson, lost a couple months rent. Um, you know, that the thing was written up, it was on the news. And not that I was paying to be, I wasn't paying to be a bad guy at all. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I didn't, I didn't want to be in the news for something like that. I wanted to be in the news for like helping people, Section 8 tenants buy homes. Um, and I certainly didn't want to uh, tarnish to rip, you know, have those, the children, the name, the family name, all that stuff. There was other articles about the thing, about the guy anyways, but but just um, I appreciate your responses on that. Um, in any case, guys, I'm going to try to wrap this up because that was that took that took the entire session. I hope this really helped you guys. Um, I, I probably should end this off on a good note, though. Um, in fact, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, let me tell you another another good one here. All right. And then we'll wrap things up. We've got a few minutes. Um, I want to I want to end the, on a positive note, not a negative note. Um, Years ago, in 2004 to be exact, this was in Western Pennsylvania where I had probably more than half of my properties anyways. A series of hurricanes have come through the area, remnants of hurricanes. By the time they got up there, they really still were hurricanes. They were like tropical storms, you know, crossing through the area twice in like a 10-day period. The second one completely flooded the area. It was amazing. I had properties underwater. Um, it was just a crazy, crazy time. I'd actually have flown out to Chicago that Friday evening, knowing we expected about an inch of rain. My my wife at the time, she's now my ex, this was year, years ago, we're going on a little bit of a honeymoon trip. We get to Chicago, I see on the news a flash, Western Pennsylvania under severe flooding, um, neighborhoods under, you know, one whole eight feet of water. I'm like, what is going on here? And my phone rang, and it was one of my uh, workers. He said, hey, Gare. You better turn on the news. It looks like your property across from the Blondie Stones underwater. I'm like, what is he talking about? It was a guy named Roger, a guy who worked for me. So I, I couldn't see anything on the news because it was Chicago. It just was a blip on the on the screen for them. But I, I thankfully, I knew the tenants in the property. I called one of them, couldn't get her phone to ring or answer. And I remember she worked at a local restaurant further, about 20 minutes away up the road. Called the restaurant. Right away, the guy hangs up. Call back and said, don't hang up. I'm calling from Chicago. One of my tenants works for you, um, Jennifer, and she lives in one of my units in Etna. And he said, Etna? Etna's gone. He said, Etna's, Etna's underwater, and I got to go. Water's coming in the back. And he hung up again. <laughs> like, now I'm, like, distraught. So how much do you think we enjoyed our honeymoon? I mean, I'm sorry, our anniversary weekend, that weekend. All weekend long, I'm just, like, stressed out. So we flew back Sunday, guys, and flying over the farms and the rivers for miles. Farms were flooded, boats were up in yards. It was just absolute mayhem. We crossed over what's called the Three Rivers in Pittsburgh, the point. There were huge 40, 50, 60 foot yachts and houseboats up in the fountain in the in the point. I mean, it's just amazing. So the next day, Monday morning, I get up and my thought is I'm gonna go in there, we're gonna get these properties cleaned out, fixed up, get them back in the market. Um, and I thought to myself, Take the deeds, just this intuitive flash. I, I call it a, a, a God wink, God telling me, you know, literally, I had no reason to think this or, or, or even do it. I just got the message and did it. Then, the goodness, I got down there, and the National Guard was there blocking all access to the area, the first area I went to, because it was completely underwater. Silt was everywhere, um, and they were only letting in um, emergency workers, you know, like FEMA workers, things like that. And uh, I actually don't think FEMA existed yet, but um, uh, I think George Bush created that out of this whole thing. But basically, Salvation Army, National Guard, and homeowners who could prove they live there. Well, think about it. Most homeowners do not leave their house and grab their deed. They're grabbing their dog and their cat and their children. So I show up with all my deeds. I say, well, I, I don't live here, but I have all the deeds to my properties. They let me in. And my four-wheel drive truck was sliding around like it was on ice. Okay? And I get in there. 
And there's people cleaning up, like little old ladies cleaning up 100-year-old photos of their parents' babies' pictures, wiping them off. Everything was turned off, electric turned off, gas turned off, water turned off, no utilities, no services, no nothing, okay? And my idea of, of you know, fixing the places up and getting them back and ready was out the window. At that point, I just started helping people get stuff out of the houses, out into the yards on the porches so they could be sifted through and cleaned off. We did that for three days. I met a lot of my children's teachers because they were not teaching. School was out. There was no school. You couldn't have school because the kids couldn't clean up anywhere. And they were, I got to meet a lot of my parents' teachers. They couldn't say had good things to say about my kids. <laughs> but they were hauling out like from basements, refrigerators, stoves, all this whole stuff, cleaning out basements, just volunteering their precious time. And I would help them. And about the third day, it became really painful, guys. I mean, ministers were there trying to minister to people, and then people were crying. It was just hardened, hardened veteran workers. I mean, Salvation Army, National Guard, and in tears. You know, it was just, it was that bad. And I every night I'd, I'd and I call my wife on the sofa and say, "Honey, I'm gonna stay as late as I can um, till the sun goes down. There's nothing more I can do when the sun goes down. These people just need help." Here's what I'm getting at: We eventually got everything fixed up and cleaned up and and uh, and and put back into service. And I only lost one tenant out of that whole deal. Everyone came back because they said it's not because I had the best property or like that. It's because I stayed with them till the bitter end, and I helped them personally. And t today, when I go back there, I'll see they're now young adults in the grocery stores, on the soccer fields. I coached soccer for years, did Cub Scouts for years, Boy Scouts, and they'll see me in the stores and stuff. And they'll say, Coach Wilson, Coach Wilson, I just want to tell you how, how much we miss you. You know, I would get Christmas cards, Kwanzaa cards for years from those people. OK, the point is, this is um, you can be a good, successful, profitable business person. OK, and you can be a compassionate human being at the same time. The answer is you can be both. I can't tell you there's a script to follow. What I can tell you is, is follow your heart. OK, and always look for the clues, look for the signs, look for the word, listen to the words um, and serve first. We call it prosperity through service. Serve first and you shall prosper as a result. Um, and I will tell you what's interesting, guys. I actually made more money on those properties as a result of that. When the um, whatever the flood insurance guys came through, the adjusters, they were writing checks to homeowners left and right. No questions asked. But to all of us landlords, they were questioning everything. But the fact is, is I came in under, under budget on every single project. I came in under budget on every project. OK, and I said, I, it's not going to take this much. I did it for less. I said, no, you keep it. That's the adjustment. That's just how it works. You keep it. And um, so I got the key. I got, actually made money on, on those projects because we did such a good job. And years later, of course, the rents all got raised. All the places had new kitchens, new bathrooms. And I got all those wonderful relationships. What an amazing turn of events. Just goes to show you, no matter what God throw your, throws your way, guys, no matter what the adversity is, you can always turn into something good, right, Genevieve? <laughs> you can always turn any any calamity into something for good. So, in any case, guys, um, uh, let me go back to questions here because we're going to wrap this up. Went over a few minutes. I apologize. Uh, let's see. This is from Bill. Um, another aha is that your application should include emergency names and numbers of persons that will not be reciting. In the unit, yeah, actually, we we did do that, Bill. But we would call those emergency numbers and just blank, nothing, you know. Uh, this is from Rolando. Uh, another appointment. Thanks for the informal sharing. You're welcome, Rolando. Genevieve says indeed. Okay, guys, um, what a great way to wrap this one up, huh? Listen to every one of you. I will see you next. Actually, I'll see many of you tomorrow night on the special broadcast on the property manager program. That's tomorrow at eight, not seven, but eight. And then next week, I will see you all in the regular webinar on the 19th at 7. And in a week from tomorrow on the 18th, another special broadcast at 8 on the flipping program. So flip, so 
Tomorrow night is um, property management, 8 p.m. Next Tuesday, the 18th, flipping at 8 p.m. That's the special program for the training program, 19th regular webinar. In the meantime, hope you guys are enjoying your, your holiday season. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa to all of you. God bless you and your families, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.